What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you my thoughts on Obsidian games after reviewing almost all of their games. Obsidian is known for their deep RPGs, often defined by player choice and consequence, and they are involved in some of the most loved games out there, Fallout New Vegas being the easiest one to point to. And in this video, we're going to be talking a little bit about their history, and obviously my thoughts about them and their future. But what I want to clarify at the beginning of this video video is that these are primarily my opinions. While there will be stuff in here that is easily verifiable, if you will, a lot of this is opinions. This is not really a documentary of any sort, and I clearly can't comment on, say, the internal culture, but if somebody who works there happens to watch and wants to enlighten us in the comments, feel free to do so, obviously. And last but not least, before we actually dive into this, to clarify which games I have and have not played, and reviewed, etc., I have not played Dungeon Siege 3, Armored Warfare, or Pathfinder Adventures. Armored Warfare is an MMO military game that Obsidian handed off to its publisher after they finished working on it, is my understanding, and Pathfinder Adventures was, or is, the digital version of the Pathfinder card game that is out there. So of those three, Dungeon Siege 3 is probably the most notable, and it's my understanding it was received pretty well, but I don't know much about it. Now, in terms of the games I have played but not reviewed, that would be South Park, The Stick of Truth, and Grounded. I've played a tiny bit of Grounded, wasn't really for me. I have done everything in South Park The Stick of Truth, I just haven't made a review. Everything else I have played and reviewed. Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2, Neverwinter Nights 2, Alpha Protocol, Fallout New Vegas, Pillars of Eternity, Tyranny, Pillars of Eternity 2, Deadfire, The Outer Worlds, and Pentiment. And we'll be discussing a little bit of those as we move through the video. But to kick this off, Obsidian was founded in June 2003, a bit before the closure of Black Isle Studios. Black Isle Studios is a another developer with a lot of history behind them, and they are certainly responsible for a lot of games that I love, and the connection between these two is not insubstantial, because Black Isle actually developed and published some of my favorite CRPGs, which is important for a channel that primarily covers those, such as Fallout and Planescape Torment. But through some poor decisions on the part of Black Isle's parent company, Interplay, Black Isle was ultimately shut down. Thus, a lot of the big names that were employed there went on to found other video game studios, Obsidian being one of them. Which is remarkable because not only did they start this new company, but they went on to face an incredible amount of adversity, and honestly just business challenges, in pursuit of making the games that they wanted to make. So let's talk about a few of those, but it must be said that a lot of Obsidian's early history revolved around them kind of shopping games to publishers, trying to get something off the ground, and towards the end of 2003, they were apparently contacted by LucasArts, which asked Obsidian to make a role-playing game for Star Wars. Their initial concept was actually rejected, and they were instead asked to work on the follow-up to Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, which is how we got KOTOR 2. Apparently, a lot of this decision came down to the fact that the people at Obsidian were already very familiar with the engine that KOTOR 1 used, and production on this began in October 2003, which I mentioned because that is when they started working on their first game as a studio. I think this is an important one to mention because KOTOR 2 is a fantastic game in a lot of ways, but I think the interesting story in terms of Obsidian here as a company is that it kind of highlights a bit of what they would be known for for quite some time, which is sequels to other games that were rushed through development. Development on KOTOR 2 was about 15 months. And these time constraints are something that plagued Obsidian throughout much of its history, but were present even here at the beginning. Because a lot of time, what happened with these cuts was that they were forced to release games that were missing some of what they had planned originally, which is why we see the restored content mod for KOTOR, for instance, and honestly just a lack of polish in terms of bugs and QA. But in spite of these things, KOTOR 2 was received quite well, and it is honestly a pretty good game if you want to go check it out. Star Wars CRP RPGs are pretty much KOTOR at this point. And the development and success of KOTOR 2 allowed them to grow a little bit, picking up more employees, kind of just from across the industry. But in particular, I wanted to mention that some people from Troika wound up here, as Troika is yet another studio known for some great games before it had to shut down, three in particular. But the next game for Obsidian was actually... 
Neverwinter Nights. At the time, the license was owned by Atari, and they wanted Obsidian to make a sequel to Neverwinter Nights, of course. So this became Neverwinter Nights 2. Yet another sequel to a Bioware title, and while Obsidian was the lead developer, Bioware apparently provided some assistance with this one. But while this was being developed, the studio continued to grow, and they were given a bit more time to work on this one, but it still really wasn't much, with it being again about 15 months total. And again, in spite of this, the game was still mostly positively received, though it did kind of lack the longevity that Neverwinter Nights has enjoyed, especially since Neverwinter Nights got an enhanced edition that restored a lot of the online functionality, but Neverwinter Nights 2 as a game was more of a game, so to speak, than the original Neverwinter Nights, as the original was more a platform for user-generated content than it was a game. It had a main campaign, but it was mostly just okay. It wasn't really going to blow you away, whereas Neverwinter Nights 2 had a full-blown campaign, saw expansions even, but also had the creator kit where you could make your own stuff, and a lot of people do to this day, but the audience just isn't as large as the first games. Though one of the expansions, Mask of the Betrayer, is very, very good, but to truly enjoy it, you kind of do need to play through the main campaign, which I mentioned because Mask is technically a standalone expansion, and it does a decent job of rectifying the pretty terrible ending for the main campaign. But while things went generally pretty well for these first two games, after that, things start getting getting more complicated. Up to this point, they hadn't worked on anything of their own, and their next game, Alpha Protocol, was actually their first original IP, which makes it especially unfortunate that they had to sign the rights over to Sega, who still has it to this day. But after Neverwinter Nights 2, they received a few different offers from publishers, but ultimately decided to work with Sega. On two separate games, actually. One was supposed to be an action role-playing game set within the Alien franchise that was called Alien's Crucible. However, this one was ultimately cancelled after Obsidian sent a prototype to Sega. Apparently they didn't even look at the demo, by the way. However, despite this cancellation, Sega still wanted to work with Obsidian to develop something. The team at Obsidian pitched a spy RPG, which which Sega approved and became the publisher for, and this is how we got Alpha Protocol. But due to some issues that were starting to show, as I mentioned, Sega actually owned the rights to Alpha Protocol. And it's my understanding this happened because after the cancellation of Aliens Crucible, they were having some money troubles, and in order to get Sega to fund the development of Alpha Protocol, they gave the rights of it to them. Which is not the last time Obsidian will have to deal with these types of problems. But Alpha Protocol is an interesting game. If anything, it was a little too ambitious. The combat is unwieldy, let's say, but not that bad overall. But what it really did have was kind of an unprecedented amount of player choice, even by today's standards, and the game's actually not available for sale anymore digitally, as it was pulled from digital marketplaces in 2019 as a result of a licensing issue with one of the songs, but you can still find physical copies of it out there if you want to play it. But one of the other problems Alpha Protocol had was that it was very buggy, the beginning of development lacked focus, and while they ultimately spent four years developing it, what it it really wanted to be didn't shape up until a bit later into development, which resulted in the delays and the longer production time before finally being released in 2010 to mixed reviews. Having played and reviewed this one myself, it has a lot of great ideas, but doesn't necessarily execute any of them particularly well. I think the player choice is the best thing it has going for it, and it's certainly a unique game to be sure. But that brings us to probably their best known title as far as these older ones go, and that is Fallout New Vegas. So believe it or not, this was actually developed at the same time as Alpha Protocol. Bethesda Softworks had originally contacted them about developing a Star Trek game, but after Bethesda Game Studios released Fallout 3, they wanted to focus more on Elder Scrolls again, and they asked Obsidian to develop another Fallout game instead, because as I alluded to much earlier in the video, Obsidian's founders had worked on the Fallout franchise while they worked for Black Isle, who made the first game, Fallout 1, the isometric game. And there are stories upon stories about the development of New Vegas. Josh Sawyer in particular has been very responsive to fans' questions over the decade since its release. Release. So there's a lot of information out there about New Vegas, and I won't belabor the point. But in terms of this video, there's a few things you need to know in particular. 
One, obviously, it was very highly praised at the time of its release, but it was, and to this day kind of is, a bit buggy, to say the least. Though many people, honestly, considered it better than Fallout 3. And Obsidian says this game in particular taught them a lot about managing quality assurance, actually, which I think is important to think about, because when we talk about financial troubles with Obsidian, I think this is one of those games that is really tied to that, because a lot of people are aware There was a potential bonus Obsidian could have gotten if New Vegas had reached a Metacritic score of 85, because it actually got an 84. And because of this, Obsidian did not get that bonus, which combined with a few other things we're about to talk about, led to a very precarious position financially, which is something they dealt with a lot at the time. But apparently they took the thoughts on QA here to heart and really focused on improving their own bug tracking systems, which apparently were implemented as soon as their next next game which was actually Dungeon Siege 3, which I don't have a lot of experience with. But it is worth mentioning that the reviews of that game at the time mentioned that it was very stable in comparison to the previous games Obsidian had released, which were known for being quite a bit buggy. That leads us to the really interesting story around the development of South Park The Stick of Truth, which I won't be showing video for even though I've played it, mostly because I want this video to be monetized. So enjoy other Obsidian games in the background for this one. But in 2009, they were contacted by South Park Digital Studios to make a game within the South Park universe. They met with South Park creators, talked about it, essentially wanted to make it the show, but a video game. Funding was originally provided by Viacom, however, Viacom let the video game publisher THQ take over. This was in 2011. Shortly after this, THQ entered a financial crisis, which resulted in them auctioning off their IPs, etc., which is how we got THQ Nordic, which acquired quite a bit of them. Believe it or not, that did not stop the South Park game, obviously, because Ubisoft actually acquired the rights for it and decided to continue with its development, which is how we got that game released in 2014. During this time, Obsidian also worked on Armored Warfare, again, a tank MMO that they handed off to the publisher afterwards, which is kind of a weird one. In the meantime, the studio had actually also seen a lot of canceled games as well, which is why you see a lot of these weird time gaps here. But for instance, they were working on a game titled Stormlands that was ultimately canceled by its publisher, Microsoft actually, which forced Obsidian to lay people off. Obsidian altered this game to a different game called Fallen that they pitched around but got no response for, and Fallen actually became the foundation for a later game, Tyranny. So just interesting stuff going on like that all the time. Here's where we get to the crux of their financial issues and Kickstarter with Pillars of Eternity. Another studio, In Exile Entertainment, was founded by former employees of Interplay Entertainment, which owned Black Isle Studios from earlier. So naturally, a lot of these people knew each other, they got along, and the companies had actually signed an agreement to share technology with each other and Obsidian actually apparently assisted in development of the Wasteland 2 Kickstarter, which ultimately went on to raise $2.1 million and was received very, very well. So fueled by that success and the lack of success, In other areas, such as the difficult situation around South Park Stick of Truth, the lost bonus from Fallout New Vegas, and lack of payment for another cancelled game, left them in pretty dire straits, to be honest, and apparently it was Josh Sawyer, actually, who proposed that the studio put a game on Kickstarter and try to secure funding that way. And this is how we got the Kickstarter for Pillars of Eternity, which is one of the games that kicked off the sort of CRPG revival that we saw recently, with Pillars of Eternity being one of the biggest of the initial batch, meant to be a sort of spiritual successor to Baldur's Gate, which again, many of these people had also worked on, or at least the other games with that engine, such as Icewind Dale. And Pillars of Eternity in the world of Aeora is one of my favorite franchises, actually. So Pillars of Eternity, the Kickstarter, was hugely successful, it broke records at the time, it raised $4 million, and the game itself was released in March 2015, and went on to make expansion packs for it, the White March, that type of stuff, which was was great because the game was very well received again. On the back of this, they made another isometric CRPG called Tyranny. Tyranny is a fantastic game that used a lot of the studio's previously canned ideas from Stormlands, Defiance, Fallen, all those games I mentioned earlier. They used a lot of those ideas to make Tyranny. 
Now, unfortunately, unlike Pillars of Eternity, Tyranny didn't do quite as well. It's honestly one of the better CRPGs out there, and I highly suggest you play it if you enjoy that genre, but financially, it was fairly underwhelming from what I understand. But after this, they made the follow-up to Pillars of Eternity with PoE2 Deadfire which again went the crowdfunding route, but this time they used FIG instead of Kickstarter, which works a bit differently, and the game itself was released in 2018. Deadfire, while eventually profitable, struggled very much so at release, which is a shame, and people quote quite a few different reasons for why this happened, but I will say Deadfire is one of the best modern CRPGs out there. It improved on the original game in just about every way, but regardless of that, the game initially struggled, but it did eventually become profitable. However, this is where we get into more present times with their Microsoft acquisition, because while Deadfire released in May of 2018, in November of 2018, it was announced that Obsidian had been bought by Microsoft, which seemed to be a solution to everyone's problems, as this effectively cured the constant financial woes that Obsidian seemed to be grappling with, while also giving Microsoft, and therefore Xbox, access to the well-received and well-loved games from Obsidian that had been getting steadily better over the years, thus filling out more of Microsoft's catalog. For Obsidian, I think this came down to, and again, this is just guessing, mostly a financial decision. This is a company that had been dealing with financial problems for most of its existence, and finally being able to make the games they want while being mostly left alone certainly seems like a win-win for everyone involved. And the very next month, Obsidian announced The Outer Worlds, their next title, which was set in an alternate future where we had colonized space, but mega corporations had taken over and turned a lot of it into corporate nonsense. This game was marketed as being from the people who worked on Fallout, which is technically true, but at the time this game was released, it was still very much so a double A in scope title. Most of this was developed before Obsidian was owned by Microsoft. So while the release for it was mostly positive, I think the market got away from them a bit as a lot of people were expecting something to rival Fallout as that was honestly in the marketing quite a bit. And that's not really what the first Outer Worlds was, which left quite a few people disappointed. From here, we get the next two games, Grounded and the most recent Pentiment. Grounded is an interesting one as it's a bit of a departure from normal for the studio in that it's a survival adventure with the idea for the game essentially being the plot to Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. You play shrunken kids in a backyard, trying to survive. I've played this one a little bit, and again, it's definitely not for me, but it's certainly something, I suppose. And then next up, we have Pentiment, the narrative adventure, which is to say it plays like a visual novel, choose-your-own-adventure book type thing, set in 16th century Bavaria, which has a lot of historical references, where you try to solve a series of murders across 25 years and uncover the story. And these two, while certainly a departure from normal for them, I think certainly highlight Obsidian's willingness to try different things. They are constantly iterating, moving things, trying different stuff, and keeping what worked and losing what didn't, which I think is why we see such a varied portfolio from them, along with cancelled games, that type of stuff, which brings us to what we can look forward to. As of right now, Obsidian is developing two announced projects, the sequel to The Outer Worlds and the title Avowed, which, while not a sequel to the Pillars of Eternity games, will be set in the same universe, but aims to be more of a first-person action RPG that they've shown off, And that one in particular has a lot of people interested. But I think these next titles from Obsidian are going to be especially interesting because they'll likely be the ones that have the full weight of the new Microsoft money behind them, so to speak. And I think they will likely be good indicators of what Obsidian is capable of when they are swinging to the fences with everything that they've got. So now that I've talked about Obsidian kind of through the years, which is certainly going to take up most of this video, I want to talk about a few things generally speaking. When I think about Obsidian and all of the trials this company, and obviously more importantly the people that work there, have been through, what I think of is growth. And I don't mean in that corporate numbers sort of way where growth is more of a financial metric. I mean growth in the terms of learning and improving over time. Getting better at the thing you are truly passionate about, and while certainly not exactly comparable, is kind of how I see running this YouTube channel. You learn
learn every day. You make adjustments. You get better. You figure out what worked, what didn't. You cut the stuff that didn't. You keep improving, trying different things until you find it. And as an entire company, that is what it looks like from the outside to me when we talk about Obsidian. Down to the story of how they struggled with bugs and QA to finally learning their lesson with New Vegas and putting in systems that allowed them to better manage these things. And since then, they've managed to cut down on a lot of that. But also at the same time, I think this went from a company that was known for making sequels in a very rushed amount of time to finally getting to work on their own original IPs that have been much loved and well received as well. And even in the cases where that didn't work out, they were able to adjust, adapt and grow for it. So when I think about Obsidian and their catalog of games and everything that goes into them, it is striking to me the passion that I see for games, which is why honestly, they're one of my favorite developers just from playing their games. Now, I can't speak for their company on an individual level. I don't know the people who work there, what their frame of mind is, that type of stuff. And the company's been around for almost 20 years. People come and go. But in all that time and all the iterations and all the things they've tried, they've very clearly kept their focus on player choice, consequence, making RPGs where the things you do matter and have consequences. And they've been refining and developing that formula this entire time. So in that way, I think it will be incredibly telling what this studio does with Avowed and The Outer Worlds 2. Because at this point, they're not dealing with the financial struggles that they long endured. They've gotten to work on several smaller passion projects. And I think it's safe to say that there's really just nothing standing in their way outside of, you know, the actual development of these two games when it comes to making the games they want to make for these two titles. And as for me, I am certainly hoping they knock it out of the park. So to wrap this up and put a bit of a bow on it, so to speak, when it comes to Obsidian, my thoughts on that studio are that they are incredibly ambitious, tenacious, and driven. And looking towards the future, while I'm certainly hopeful, I think we will soon find out whether that tenacity and drive was the result of simply their backs being up against the wall, and if they can keep aiming higher going forward. But I know a lot of people, myself included, are certainly very interested in where they go from here. But that, guys, as long-winded as it was, is my thoughts on Obsidian Studios after reviewing and playing pretty much all of their games. Let me know what you think down in the comment section below. I'd love to hear what you have to say on the subject. If anyone from Obsidian happens to watch this and is in a position where they're allowed to talk, I'd love to sit down and chat with you about the studio, future projects, whatever you're allowed to talk about, I suppose. But as for everyone else watching, truly, thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. We passed 100k subs not even a month ago. I finally got my award for that recently, and I can't thank people enough for watching and entertaining my opinions on these subjects. So again, thank you. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.